And welcome back. Having come out clean of allegations of nepotism, Akewumi Adeshina has been re-elected as the president of the African Development Bank. With this election, he will spend another five years managing the affairs of the bank. Before his re-election, Adeshina had made a case for his re-election, stating that he wanted to fulfill his sense of duty and commitment. But now that his re-election has been confirmed, what is next for the AFDB? Joining us to discuss this is Bismarck Rewani, the CEO of uh, Financial Derivatives, and also, of course, uh, Liberal Sushoma. Welcome, uh, Mr. Rewani. Thank you very much. I'm going to kick off with you. And of course, first of all, congratulations to Akimu Miyadishino. I, I want to know what you think this means um, for Africa um, in general and for the bank. Uh, definitely for us as economists, it means a, it's a big deal. But what we have to understand is that uh, we're going to take a three-dimensional analytical approach to this uh, re-election. Uh, first and foremost, it puts, it erases partially the stereotypical notion that all Africans are corrupt, they lack transparency, accountability, and they are allergic to probity. Our condition has shown that that is not true. That is Africa as a whole, and Nigeria in particular. So it, it clears more, most of the reputational tarnish that exists for Africans and especially Nigerians. Secondly, before this event, Aki Adeshina and his team had actually worked towards increasing the capital of the bank. So as a multilateral development institution, uh, AFDB is now competitive with the Asian Development Bank, the World Bank, and other multilateral agencies. Now, so it is now time to use the additional capital, the intellectual capital that exists in the, in the institution in Africa to serve as a catalyst for development in the first place, and secondly, to achieve sustained and accelerated growth, especially at a time when we, the continent is projected to be having a negative growth, of, uh, technically in recession, for the rest of 2020 and part of 2021. So it, I, I think, one, it's a, it's a call to duty. Two, it helps to clear up the reputational tarnish. And then it help, it will give the opportunity to use the additional capital and the intellectual property to serve as a catalyst for growth, one, two, to develop institutional and development uh, uh, framework and uh, apparatus. Now to actually change the narrative and also change the structure of the African economy, especially now that there's a shift from just being a production economy, uh, to, from a commodity dependent economy to a production economy and actually towards being a service economy. So this is, uh, no better time than this, no better person than a conditional. And it's a, it's a vote of it's thanks to Africa and congratulations to Africa and congratulations to Nigeria in all in all ways. And I think that what you are going to see is that uh, a conditional will, will show in a second term, like most others that is up to the task. Now you've spoken about the second term. I'm going to go to Liberals in a bit, but I also want you to speak on the high fives. While he was campaigning for re-election, he spoke of five strategic priorities to be implemented for the continent's development, and he called them the high fives, the improvement of quality of life, to integrate Africa, to feed Africa, to industrialize Africa, and of course, power up Africa. Do you think that he did exceptionally well with those high fives, and should he also be improving um, on those high fives with his second um, term? They did as best as they could, but now is the time. The resilience of the African economies is not being put to test because we have four or five major challenges. One is how to implement the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, which is critical. The single aviation market, which is an open skies agreement for African airlines, and so that we can fly from point to point without having a free freedom abuse of rights. Three, the ECOWAS protocol which is for West Africa and the regional integration protocols. And then three and four is the fact that um, the economy, the, the economies of Africa are stratified amongst those who are large, like Nigeria, South Africa, Angola, and uh, probably Kenya. And then they're only tiny, there are 54 African countries. How do you ensure that all of these African countries play to their strengths, develop the, the, the mentality of comparative advantage? So basically, attract investments, catalyze the economies, right? 
increase the multiplier effect and the linkages between uh, African trade. And then finally, and most importantly, to ensure that we can achieve a rate of growth so that our income per capita, which as a, as a continent is about $1,900 to $2,000, can get up to maybe five, six, seven thousand dollars $7,000 per head and actually reduce our vulnerability to disease, ignorance, and make us um, virtually, I mean, com- com- competitive like all other continents in the, in the world. All right, nicely put. I'm going to go to Liberal Sashoma now um, on the political angle of this. Um, I, I want to know, um, first of all, during the COVID era, uh, the bank was able to raise about $3 billion you know, for um, support um, for the African continent and, of course, for the bank. Um, I want to know what your thoughts are with African leadership and partnership with the African Development Bank. Um, what Akimumi Additional has been trying to achieve for the longest time in the last five years. Do you think that African leadership itself understands the value of the bank and how much growth they would be able to achieve simply with uh, great partnerships? Um, first and foremost, um, if um, African leaders actually understood the need and the partnership of the bank, um, we wouldn't have... Um, um, shareholders, you know, foreign shareholders outside of African country. If you remember, I think it was in 1982 or so, um, that um, during um, the first recapitalization of the bank, um, the bank ordinarily from inception was not to admit shareholders from outside of Africa. But because of lack of funds, and because at that time, I think it was uh, simply Nigeria and one other, was in South Africa, one other country, that was um, that were the rich countries that were bankrolling the bank, and so as at that time they now had to admit, you know, members from outside of Africa, and and so until uh, recently or so, it's almost as if um, the leaders in Africa still do not believe that the solution to the problems of Africa lies in Africa, and and so there was need to look inward, and then also if you also know the problems that. Um, um, Akiomi Additional went through just before this uh, re-election, you would understand um, why there is greater need for Africans to look inward. Uh, and um, all, all sort of interference, seeing that, um, you know, it was almost as if there was somebody who was ready to stand up, you know, to the West and look um, and take, take the bank from, you know, where it was to a whole new level, where the bank actually can compete internationally and so the time is now because all of the um, uh, uh, what do you call it um, um, the areas that Kiwumi has lined up to achieve including his, the performance during his uh, first tenure uh, you know you can't actually he can't do far better if he does not have the collaboration of the African leaders and he, they need to buy in for African to go further for African to be able to achieve, you know, um, be it um, regional integration, uh, whether uh, um, bilateral trade agreement or even um, um, what do you call it, um, um, some of the economic policies also that um, some of the countries had, uh, you know, formulated and tried to pursue. Without that, without a, 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 a framework, a platform to actually synergize and coordinate like that, very difficult for them and, and you're still consistently going to be running back to the Bretton Woods, to the World Bank, to, to China yeah. and some of these other foreign countries for assistance. And then some of the conditions also, you know, for, uh, from these countries also are not too friendly condition. And so if the bank is also able to recapitalize, then it will be able to have a you know, very stronger base and platform yeah. within which you know, to actually, you know, lift up some of this. Great thing you just spoke about um, um, foreign um, investments and the rest. I'm going to go back to uh, Bismarck Rowani now. In, in 2018-2019, um, Akin Wumi Additional and, of course, uh, the bank were able to increase investment interest in, in the bank and, of course, in Africa. COVID-19 has changed the story of the economy with, you know, uh, the all of uh, 2020. Do you think it is still possible that the bank would be able to achieve increased investment um, in, in the bank and, of course, in Africa for, um, uh, this year? Definitely. Um, first and foremost, our rating, the, ba- the rating of the bank by Moody's, Standard Poor's, Fitch, and all the global area where we, we came out at par with every other multilateral to investment grade. And that is why they're able to raise capital at a lower cost 
than any other person. Secondly, because of the depth, the inter intellectual depth within the bank and the leadership, yeah. that's another vote of confidence. But what point I want to make is that if you think that because he has been re-elected, that is the end of the struggle for repairing the reputation damage and the st stereotypes that Africans and Nigerians have, no. Part of his part is to continue to show in the next five years that one, he can entrench those principles and values, institutionalize them, and transfer them across the continent so that one, the multilateral agency called the AFDB, two, the African countries they interact, interact with, and they maintain the standard so that African countries are not asked to borrow at less than uh, friendly rates, but also to make sure that we, they, they become the disciples of discipline, accountability, and transparency, whilst at the same time using the funds efficiently as a catalyst for growth and building both social and, and mark my words, social, institutional, and physical infrastructure. This is where our condition will make a difference. Don't forget that he came in and worked as a consultant, became the Minister of Agri, made an impact, moved on to the ADB, helped to raise capital, fought a major battle, psychological battle, with the new colonialists who wanted to, you know, you know, to actually impose their values and their own system and their this, the uh, psychological um, dependency complex. That has all been taken care of in the first place. But now, how do we make those transparent principles into things that are tangible for growth and for improving the standard of living of Africans, especially at a time when COVID has put, put our economic well-being under threat? Oh, it, it's, it's very interesting. And of course, uh, we're looking forward to seeing more of those figures. $3 billion investment was something that was definitely celebrated across uh, the continent, um, you know, when it, you know, uh, came or when it happened. Um, I'm going to go, Libros, one minute. I want you to, to state your, um, what your targets would be for Akimu Um And of course, representing Nigeria on that platform. Yeah, um, now it is not just about Nigeria, but the entire Africa mm -hmm. and uh, African as a whole will look up to him. But yeah. um, he can't, um, you, you, saw, you saw how, you know, um, the foreign partners and shareholders, you know, almost ridicule all, the, all of the achievements, you know, um, of uh, Makume uh, additional, you know, with all of those allegations before this, uh, this step. And if not for the support, the massive support yeah. that he enjoyed from, you know, Africa, he probably wouldn't have been able to achieve this mileage. And so that's where, you know, the leadership in Africa needs to understand that he can't go the OHOG. And I, like I always say, Africa needs to now begin to look inward. And so that's where the leadership needs to sit down now and rally around him and ensure that he succeeds. Or otherwise, at the end of the day, all of the mileages that he would have achieved, you know, would uh, free tie away after five years from now if you know the leadership are not in synergy and collab uh, co um, and um, consolidate you have to consolidate on all of those achievements brilliant Bismarck Rawane we're ending the program with you this evening I want to get your thoughts on partnerships with African leadership once again um, it is very very important that they play their role you know to make the job of Akimumi addition a little little easier I guess so what are your thoughts on getting the best out of African leadership at a time like this I think it's pretty clear first and foremost he's come out of this and his, his, his mandate is clear he's, uh, he's going to institutionalize the process he's going to work with African country without not by lowering standards but assisting them to build the capacity and also to build the, the economic capital and infrastructure to achieve those goals. So I don't want us to judge Akin Adesina's tenor only just by how much he, he interacts with Africa. But one, maintaining the standards which he has set up, which he has achieved, institutionalizing it, transferring the same to other African countries and holding them to account so that he not only serves as an example of uh, leadership and strategic thinking, but also as somebody who can deliver. And more than anything else, let me be clear to you that the big challenge for African leaders today is not the fiscal and financial adjustment or the growth, the growth trajectory. But more than anything else, 
It's a mental adjustment to accept that the challenge is there and that we must bring out the best in our people to, and to make us competitive. Because let's face it, 20, 30 years ago, China and India were in the same state where Africa is today. And in a matter of 20, 30 years, they've been able to accomplish this. I think that yeah. with today's technology, today's um, information um, and broadband, broadband network, we can do the same as a continent in five years. So I'm looking forward to our additional, being jointly with other African leaders, lifting Africa from this base where we are and put them on the, the non-return path, right? The path of no return in terms of growth, the path of no return in terms of being a source of intellectual capital, in terms of labor, in terms of uh, IT, and in terms of being not only commodity producers, manufacturing and service and a big market. I think yeah, this is Africa's, this is the continent day. And today I celebrate and I congratulate additional and all of Africa for this um, epoch making event. Yeah. Thank you. Liberal Soshoma and uh, Bismarck Rawani, thank you so much for uh, sharing your thoughts with us uh, this evening on uh, Plus Politics. Thank you for having me. And thank you for staying with us. We'll take a short break now. When we return, I'll be giving my take. Year after year, from one administration to the next, for the longest time, there has been the talk about judicial reforms in Nigeria. And just like that, a lot of other aspects of our nation also, you know, have had similar conversations. We do not suffer from the absence of ideas or solutions. We don't lack brilliant minds to prefer solutions to the many issues plaguing our nations. Our biggest challenge has always been implementation and the political will to make a difference. Just as we have a new Inspector General of Police coming in with fresh orders to clear roadblocks across federal highways. But it always seems to be just powerful statements and no actions backing them up. Our criminal justice system has experienced this rot we speak of today for many, many years. Unfortunately, it's not the judicial system uh, that is in need of these reforms. It is law enforcement, the judicial process, and corrections. All need urgent reforms. All need a complete miracle from cases that have dragged on for more than a decade. If you remember the Apo 6, 15 years ago after the murder of those six young Nigerians. From there to the persons who have languished behind bars for as much as 11 years without trial. What type of system keeps its citizens incarcerated for a decade without trial? How does a prison built to have 950 inmates occupy 2,600? A justice system that only seems to give justice to those who can afford it. We all know the solutions to most of Nigeria's issues. We know what steps must be taken. But unfortunately, we have lacked the political will. The president made a similar speech in 2019. He has made another one yet again this year. When will we take action? Nigerians are tired of these stories in the news. It no longer excites the fellow Nigerian. Think of Ahmed or Emeka or Tunde, who has been incarcerated for the last few years without trial. He doesn't care about political statements anymore. He wants action. And that's it on Plus Politics uh, this evening. Join us same time tomorrow on the program. I am Osaogi Ogbonwan.